ex parte communications. How long does this all take? Well, we're going to go through the timeline, and it's, it's a fairly long timeline, but it ends at 365 days from the date that the application was, was accepted. So let, let me take you through it. Okay, some of, some of this has already occurred. At some time before the Chinook application was filed, at least 30 days before the filing, uh, the applicant, I believe, they came here, Doug? Was it in this building? Came here and they had what they call a free application public information uh, session. Um, and I understand that that took place on July 18th. That's not something that the committee itself was involved in, uh, but that's sort of the first public event uh, in our timeline. Once the application is filed, and in this case it was filed on October 18th, uh, the administrator sends it out to all of the agencies, state agencies, who might have jurisdiction or other regulatory authority over any aspect of the, of the proposal. We also designated a subcommittee on November 8th, and the word expeditiously is there because that's what the statute says we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do these things expeditiously. And the state agencies who we sent the application out are required to review that application in an expeditious fashion uh, and get back to us within 60 days to tell us, is this application complete for their purposes? And in this particular case, uh, all of the relevant state agencies did get back to us and determined that the application was complete for their purposes and, and the subcommittee held a hearing on the application after having reviewed it and said the application is complete and they accepted the application. Um, was it December 17th was the date that we accepted the application and that's the date that most of our other timelines run from, the date of acceptance of the application. Now, mind you, acceptance doesn't mean that they're going to grant the certificate. It just means that there was sufficient information in the application for the case to proceed. Um, the next step in our timeline is what we're doing tonight, is to hold a public information session so that the public can learn about the project and learn about the site evaluation committee process. Our next step, we'll actually meet our subcommittee, and that'll be at a joint public hearing right here in Fitzwilliam, and it will occur on February 20th. Um, we're required to do it within 90 days of acceptance of the application. And that's called a joint public hearing because uh, preferably there will also be representatives from the various state agencies here. Uh, so the subcommittee of the site evaluation committee will be here, as will hopefully representatives from the various state agencies. And then we go into our sort of pre-adjudicative process. The agencies will do a deeper dive into the application, and especially those aspects that, for instance, DES will deal with environmental issues, the Division of Historic Resources will take a deeper dive into how our historic resources and archaeological resources uh, affected by this project. Um, and they'll give preliminary reports to the Site Evaluation Committee by May 15th, 150 days after the acceptance of the application. And those preliminary reports, once filed, will be available on our website. There, this is all public hearing and that um, these reports are all public unless there's something secret in them. And I will tell you, there are statutes in New Hampshire which require confidential treatment of things like where there might be archeological resources. So in some cases, you will see what's called a motion for protective order filed on, on things like that. The agencies, after giving their preliminary reports, give us our final reports, uh, in this case by August 13th which is 240 days after the acceptance of the application, and then we begin our adjudicative process, the trial process, if you will. And that's going to start no earlier than August 13th, um, this coming summer. Um, and then uh, that proceeds just like you see on TV. There will be witnesses and cross-examination. There will be memos of law filed, um, and ultimately the Site Evaluation Committee Subcommittee will sit in front of you all uh, and deliberate. And they're actually required to deliberate in public and they'll vote the project up or down. They'll vote to either grant a certificate or deny a certificate. Um, and um, then a written order will come out. 
Seems like a long timeline, um, but you'd be surprised how fast it goes. But during the course of that time, we had lots of opportunities for public participation. Um, it began before even the site evaluation committee was, was involved. Uh, one of the things that the applicant was required to file with their application is the transcript of the pre-application information session. So that's already been filed, filed along with the application. Um, so there's been public input there. There is tonight, anybody who wishes to give input or ask questions tonight, that will all become part of the record of our proceeding. There will be the public hearing that's on February 20th in front of the subcommittee. And the uh, site evaluation committee accepts written comments from the public all the way through until the evidence is closed in the adjudicated process. So literally up to the day that they vote on whether to grant or deny a certificate, they will consider any written comments. There are also, um, on occasions, uh, times when we will, during the trial process, set aside an hour or two for uh, public comment at that time. Uh, to learn if, if we're going to do that, you have to follow the scheduling notices that will come from, from our chairperson. Um, there's another way to intervene. If you believe that the project affects you individually or affects a group that you might belong to, um, you can also file a petition to intervene. Uh, those are due tomorrow, day after tomorrow, by Friday. Um, and in order to uh, file, in order to have a motion to intervene granted, you've got to show that you have a demonstrable in interest um, in the outcome of the proceeding. Um, if you wish to intervene as a party, you would be uh, requesting to act like a party, to come to the hearings, uh, to act in accordance with the site evaluation committee rules, if you're granted intervention status, um, and um, you have to by the rules. Um, of course, everybody who has a right to proceeding has the right to counsel at your own expense. Um, and if you were to um, intervene in the proceeding, uh, you could hire a lawyer to represent you um, if your intervention was granted. Or you could hire a lawyer to move for your intervention as well. Um, so the, those are the areas where the public can be involved in our cases. What does the site evaluation committee have to find? What is it that they actually do? There are certain criteria, criteria and findings that the statute, our enabling statute, as I said before, the statute that gives authority to the site evaluation committee, requires that the site evaluation committee consider certain things. The first is whether the applicant has adequate financial, technical, and managerial capabilities to site construct and operate the project in a manner that would be consistent with the certificate and any conditions that are in the certificate. A second consideration that the Site Evaluation Committee must determine is whether the project will unduly interfere with the orderly development of the region, giving due consideration to the views of municipal agencies, regional planning agencies, and municipal governing bodies. Um, so the Site Evaluation Committee will consider the views of the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, if there's any, any of these agencies that come forward and present their views, those will be considered. Now, as I said before, the Site Evaluation Committee does not have to follow them, nor does the applicant have to go through your local procedures, but the Site Evaluation Committee, by the law, must consider those views. And the Site Evaluation Committee, in order to grant a certificate, must find that the, that the project, the siting, construction, or operation of the project will not have an unreasonable adverse effect on aesthetics, historic sites, air and water quality, the natural environment, public and the public health and safety. And finally, the committee must determine whether or not the project will serve the public interest. All of those things are considered uh, by the Site Evaluation Committee, and if you've ever gone to one of our deliberative sessions where the Site Evaluation Committee is determining 
whether to grant the certificate or not, you'll see that they go through each and every one of those things, just like chapters in a book. Um, and they consider each one of them before uh, they get to a final decision as to whether or not to grant the certificate. Um, again, our contact information, First, your first point of contact should be Ms. Monroe, um, and her information is up there. So I guess we'll move on to the next part of our, um, of our agenda, which is the presentation by the applicant. Um, but just so you know, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have the ability to ask questions, and if you have questions of anything that I've spoken about, I'm, I'm here to answer them, but we'll do that in the question portion of the agenda. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heath Bearcut, and I'm a project director with Next Era Energy. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about Chinook Solar. This is the second opportunity that I've had uh, to visit and share information about this facility uh, here in Fitz William. And once again, I, I thank all of you, members of the public, and, and uh, representatives of the town, and of course, uh, the committee for for allowing uh, the project team and myself to, to be here. So, Chinook Solar is a facility being proposed by NextEra Energy. NextEra Energy is the world's leading generator of energy from the wind and the sun. We have 90 solar projects operating in 36 states, and since 2004, we've deployed more than $85 billion worth of uh, energy infrastructure. And we think that this demonstrates our commitment to the communities in which we work to successfully design, build, construct, operate uh, renewable energy generating facilities. Chinook Solar is a 30 megawatt photovoltaic solar generation facility proposed here in the town of Fitzwilliam. It's located east of town, south of Route 119, and east of Route 12. It will lie on land that historically has been logged for timber. And its footprint will be 110 acres. We have filed an application for site facility with the New Hampshire Site Evaluation Committee. That was done back in October. And of course, tonight is the continuation of that process. If we successfully secure a permit, we anticipate beginning construction in the winter of 2020 into 2021. We would target a commercial operation date of October 2021. We've heard a pretty good amount of detail um, on the SEC process already tonight. I won't go into that in further detail in my presentation, but of course, if we have specific questions um, afterwards, we'd, we'd be happy to address any of those. We've engaged in a lot of work. Our panel of experts, engineers, have been busy surveying, analyzing, investigating various aspects of the project as it relates to the environment, as it relates to aesthetics, um, the overall design of the facility. And we're very proud of the results. We've uh, 
achieve design structure that we think um, fits very well with the proposed location. And many of these reports are, are all available as part of our application, um, which may be found both at the um, New Hampshire Site Evaluation Committee's um, website and uh, hard copies also have been made available here to the town as well for the public to review. None of this has happened in a vacuum. We've continuously consulted with various agencies in, well, here in New Hampshire. Um, we've uh, investigated or sought advice on any area of interest. Um, that feedback has along the way been incorporated in, into our design plans and, and we've demonstrated uh, a consistent effort in trying to communicate with the agencies to ensure that we have a successful um, project. Um, notably, you know, Fish and Game consults with um, any species of interest, for example, alteration of terrain, of course, for uh, stormwater management. Um, in parallel, we've also shared information here in the town with the planning board and the select board and tried to work consistently follow up to, to share that information uh, with the public. Throughout this process, this has led us to ultimately achieve a design which we feel very confident um, works with the location and one which we think the community can also be proud of. It is optimized in a variety of ways. Um, it, the site makes use of, to the fullest extent possible of existing logging roads. Um, given the, the history of tree logging on the site, we've minimized potential for tree clearing. We've avoided any direct impact to wetlands. There are certain design features that are incorporated that allow mobility of wildlife. Um, there are gaps in the fence lines that allow um, that to occur. There's, there are also gaps um, in the bottom of the fences that, for example, allow turtles to migrate from wetlands during breeding season up to the highlands, um, as well as small mammals and other wildlife to move throughout the facility. Also notably, there are two high voltage transmission quarters that run adjacent to where the project is located. The first of which is a 345 kV transmission line. And then in addition, there is a two circuit, 150 millivolt <coughs> transmission line. to the town over the life of the project. So for all those reasons, we, we feel that we've designed a, a, a great facility and, and one that we're very optimistic in um, moving forward with. Thank you. I, we brought Mark Wallace um, with us. He is our sound, our sound expert. And we know last time when we were here, there were a lot of questions about sound, and, and it's very difficult to kind of discuss sound in abstract terms. So we we thought uh, a little demonstration here might might be helpful.
My name is uh, Mark Wallace. I'm uh, with Tech Environmental. I'm a vice president at the firm. I'm also the project manager for the uh, Chinook Solar Sound Stand. I was asked to give a demonstration tonight of what the sound would be from the project versus what we might measure in this room. So I'm going to give an overview of the sound study that we did, and then I'll do a, a brief demonstration of, of the sound that we're measuring in the room. Um, but first I'd like to talk about how sound is measured. Measured with a sound meter, it's measured in decibels, uh, or dBs, that's the abbreviation for it. And typically it's measured in A-weighted scale, which are the frequencies that people tend to hear. So the numbers that you see are on a DBA level. What we did uh, as part of our sound study was perform an ambient survey where we took measurements uh, of sound uh, from the uh, project site area. We set up a long-term sound meter in the center of the site and we collected measurements over a 24-hour period. Um, the quietest hours uh, that we had were during the daytime and the nighttime. The sound level was 23 decibels, or dBA, uh, during the daytime, and 20 decibels at night. We then performed an acoustic modeling analysis, uh, which was done with a three-dimensional sound model. We included receptor points that represented 51 homes surrounding the site, we took into account terrain, atmospheric conditions, and we also put in the sound sources, the inverters and the transformer, and their predicted sound levels. The model then predicted sound levels in each of the homes, and uh, those sound levels range from 5 decibels to 26 decibels, which is shown on the chart uh, over to the, to, the, uh, to the right over there. And and that also shows what the sound levels would be from other types of sources. Um, those sound levels were then added to the background sound levels. So those sound levels that we collected establish a baseline condition. The total sound was then compared to the ambient condition. Uh, and that incremental change <coughs> is what we compared to the state and the Fitzwilliam uh, noise ordinance which is based on a 10 decibel or dBA level above ambient. The, uh, for most of the homes, the sound levels were between zero and three decibels, which are imperceptible by people. And a few homes that were uh, closest to the project, we did have sound levels that were about four to six decibels above the ambient condition. But keep in mind, those were uh, based on when the facility is running at max power, uh, and when at the quietest conditions. Um, so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about this demonstration. So what I have here is a uh, iPad that uh, has, has its own microphone, but we've attached one of our microphones, which is a, which is a laboratory calibrated uh, microphone, which is sensitive to plus or minus one decibel. So it's much more sensitive than the one that's with the iPad itself. The iPad is now communicating to the computer, which is then showing you what it's measuring uh, for sound in the room, and it's primarily myself, you know, conversing with you folks. Um, so what I like to do is I'll just stop talking, and we can measure the sound that's in the room, so that we can compare that to what the project sound level is. So it's it's registering about 39 decibels, which is about uh, 15 decibels higher than what we would be expecting from the project from its maximum sound level. Uh, to give that some kind of perspective, um, you know, for every doubling of sound, you get a, a very 10 decibel increase, I'm sorry, uh, is a doubling of sound. So uh, with a 15 decibel increase, it's about three times as loud in this room than what the project is going to be doing. So for example, if you were at home, and you have your television, and you say you set it at 20, and then you raised it to, say, 60, that would be about a 15 decibel increase in sound, or about three times as loud. So at least give you a better perspective of what the sound is in this room compared to what the project is going to be emitting. So that's my brief demonstration of sound, and I'll be willing to take any questions during the, the Q&A portion of the evening.
Okay, that ends the presentation portion of the um, of the meeting. So, um, does anybody have green forms or like to fill one out? Um, do you have questions that we can take? Because we have a few up here that um, we can go through without hands. Anybody want one? Okay, let me come get them. start with the first two questions that we have that both appear to be for the applicant. Um, the first one is, goes as follows, as a property owner, my taxes are excessive. Will this solar development cause our real estate taxes to decrease? Please quantify. <coughs> Whoever from your team you want to address that is fine. I'll just say that the project is negotiating with the town on uh, payment in lieu of taxes agreement, which would provide tax stabilization in terms of uh, the, the revenues the town would receive and the, the tax exposure that the project would face. And I think there's a mutual benefit to both parties uh, in, in having an agreement such as that in place. With respect to what that would do to the town's tax roll, I, I, I don't have any information available on that. Next question is a lengthy one. I'll read it as it was written. When you were here last, you stated that your sound study showed that only four residences would be impacted by the noise from the solar arrays transformers. The term impacted is an industry euphemism used to soften the real issue. The real issue is that these households will be harmed by the noise. What changes have you made to the design since your last visit to mitigate the harm that will be inflicted on these residents? Have you designed a sound wall, integrated isolation strategies, considered encapsulation, or other reasonable accommodations? You said that you want to be a good partner in our community. I look forward to hearing your response regarding the measures that you have built into your new design to alleviate this concern. I figured you'd take it. <laughs> um, so we haven't changed anything in our sound study from what was presented during the pre-application uh, meeting back this summer. Um, I will say that, you know, we have taken into account a lot of different uh, <coughs> things within our model uh, to address the potential sound from, from the transformer. The, the size of the transformer is, uh, is pretty small. The other, the other portion to it is that, um, you know, it's for a solar project. It's not for a large substation or from a typical type of substation. Um, and when we did our sound study, I know there were some concerns about tonal issues, and we, we addressed that in our, in our uh, current study. We looked at different tones from the transformers as well as from the inverters. Um, we uh, compared that to the Fitzwilliam um, tonal uh, <coughs> portion of that, and there were no uh, tonal sounds that were being impacted at any of those homes. The sound levels are being four to six decibels uh, at a few of those homes. Uh, are on the on the level again where we're assuming maximum operations of the of the facility um, and comparing that to the quietest hour, which is generally not going to be the case. Um, and I would also like to point out the fact that when we did our ambient sound survey, we captured very ideal conditions for the lowest ambient sound condition. So when we're looking at that incremental change. It's very conservative from the standpoint of we're looking at maximum sound level conditions from the project and comparing it to a very low background sound level. So in, in those cases where we're seeing a four to six decibel increase, it's slightly noticeable for, for those, those people, but again, it would be under those extreme conditions. Okay. The next question appears to be for the committee. Uh, there are two questions on the sheet. I'll do the first one first and I'll answer it. 
Has the town of Fitzwilliam filed to intervene? The answer to that is yes. The town of Fitzwilliam has filed a timely uh, motion to intervene, and the applicant has indicated that it does not object to the town of Fitzwilliam intervening in the proceeding. Um, the second question on the sheet is, oh, by the way, that motion uh, is, on, is on our website. Um, if you need the website again, you can get it up here at the table. Um, the, but the motion from the town is available to the public. As will all the motions or anything that's filed in this that is not subject to a protective order for some statutory reason. Uh, we try to post everything in the case on our website um, so that the public is fully informed of uh, all aspects of the operation of the committee and, uh, and the project. And I'll just add if um, I have a service list for the project, if you would like to be on the service list, what that means is that your email address would be added to it, and when people, uh, parties to the proceeding file documents, you would get it as it simultaneously as it's filed with the committee. Sometimes there's a lag of a day or two uh, to get the documents up on the website, and it's just because it's staff, I have staff, uh, staff at the PUC to have other things, but we try and get them up there as timely as possible. So if you are interested in receiving them real time as everybody else does, send me an email and I will add you to the service list. Your email box can be full very quickly. Um, the next question is, I'm gonna read it as it, it's written, but I noticed this too. Benefits, what was that about meeting renewable goals? There are renewable portfolio standards established um, in each of the states in New England, and facilities such as this help um, the utilities achieve those goals. And, and what those goals seek to establish is um, a certain amount of the energy uh, consumed uh, regionally has to be comprised of, of renewable sources. Next question is, can you describe how the site plan shown on the easel has changed since the public meeting this past summer? And make sure you tell us your name, sir. Good evening, Joe Pashino, the Italian Bob. I'm the uh, site civil engineer for the project. Site civil engineer for the project. We, um, we essentially performed the layout of the facility, including the access drives and um, solar community array. The largest change, there are some small changes throughout regarding um, uh, slight relocation of access drives due to um, further considerations of um, the, the overall layout of the site with some um, uh, new resource areas being identified that we were um, Again, maintaining uh, the commitment to avoid those resource areas. So um, the old plan, the, the largest um, you know difference really is the old plan had a access drive that kind of went through this area, which was then found to to be a, a wetland area. So we relocated the drive, um, the access drive, up, up and along more towards the northern portion of the site, and um, that required an additional. Crossing, that's an open span crossing, so that would avoid any direct water impacts. That's primarily the largest change in the plan. Uh, next question has to do with wildlife. Um, it's actually several questions, but they're all in the same, uh, same category. So, uh, it's mostly about the fence. First, how tall is the fence? How far apart are the gaps in fencing uh, for the wildlife? How many gaps are there, and what size is, what size wildlife does it restrict, uh, or I guess the flip side of that would be, what size wildlife does it allow to go under the fence? Dana Ballou, and uh, I'm from TRC, and uh, so the first question is, how tall is the fence? Seven feet, I think, is the standard for the height of the fence. Um, 
gaps between the fences and the next one? Yes, how far apart are the gaps in the fencing for wild land? So around, yeah, underneath. So, so underneath it's a uh, six inch gap for small wildlife to be able to traverse underneath um, the, the fence and also you know, cross under where the panels are. But each panel array is, has gaps in between it as well. So then those vary, and that would be for the large, larger mammals that can't squeeze under the fence. They, there's spaces in between the, um, each set of arrays. And what's the size of those? Uh, they vary. Um, some are probably 500 feet. Some are 100 feet. So it varies depending on the, the layout. So you can take a closer look at the site plan and see the gaps between the, the, um, each of the array sets. And I guess uh, the question is also concerned about what size of wildlife is restricted or not restricted. Yeah, so, so within the um, arrays where the panels are located, large wildlife would be restricted. Um, and then in between the array areas, any size of wildlife could, could fit in between. And can you tell them what, what you consider to be large wildlife? Large story. wildlife, uh, larger than um, snowshoe hare. So, you know, six inch gap under the fence, anything that could fit under that six inch gap could traverse the array areas. Uh, between the arrays, anything larger, you know, up, up to a moose could easily walk between the arrays. Thank you. The next question has to do with wetlands. You said there would be no direct impact on wetlands. What are the indirect impacts? So any uh, indirect impacts are um, probably related to um, any stormwater runoff that's coming from the site. So in order to avoid that, uh, stormwater runoff um, has been designed to uh, Go out, go off the site in a sheet flow for the most part, so it's able to infiltrate into the ground. And um, also, we're we're trying to maintain a 75 foot setback at least from all wetland areas. Some some cases it's more, and there are, are a few areas where we do encroach into 75 feet, and it's primarily where we cross with open span. So there's two locations where we cross wetland area with spans that are not impacting the wetland directly. There, there are abutments that are set back from the wetland boundary and then the access spans across. Along those lines, the next question is, what are the impacts, direct and indirect, to Scott Brook? I think Scott Brook, is that? Scott Brook, yeah, so Scott, we're in the Scott Brook watershed for most of the project area, and there's, there's no direct impact to Scott Brook. Um, it's it's pretty pretty distant from the project. The question is direct or indirect. And so indirect, again, it could be um, something related to stormwater runoff, which we're you know managing um, based on DES standards and requirements. Okay, let's take a moment here and check their Check all the all the boundaries of, um, from the 
based on that original delineation, and we identified some areas that weren't identified. 2019 was a much better year. Um, so, so then, you know, we identified new areas that hadn't been identified initially. So then the project design shifted to um, avoid those new areas. Um, next question, um, maybe we may need a different person to answer it, is this is a follow-up to the Renewable Portfolio Standard response. Since Connecticut and Rhode Island are buying the power, don't the recs approve to those states rather than New Hampshire? Yes, they do. Um, that's correct. There are um, two benefits, though, that remain local. The first of which is the power does feed in to the local transmission grid here in New England. Um, New Hampshire is part of the regional grid, and so uh, here in New Hampshire, you benefit that way. And the other benefit is the, the property tax payments stay local. And just for those, I should have, instead of using the term REX, Renewable Energy Credits is what the acronym REX stand for. In our business, we use lots of acronyms, unfortunately. Um, there is a comment that follows this question. It says, I support this and I, and I am happy and proud to have it in the Monadnock region, but I don't think it helps New Hampshire meet RPS goals. I don't know if you want to respond to that one. It's not a question, it's just a statement. Are there any other questions, any other written questions from the audience? There's one in the back there. <coughs> Okay. Eversource said that there would be no noise from the Route 12 substation. There was. They said that the wall would not fix it. It did. What is your commitment to helping homeowners if your sound modeling is wrong and the noise at their home is unacceptable? subject to our permitting conditions and to the extent we are not within those conditions, obviously we will remain under the jurisdiction of the site evaluation committee and we will have to address those. Are there any other questions, uh, written questions from the audience? Okay. Okay, so that closes the uh, question part of it. I see uh, yellow. I have two, two people here. I guess we have a couple more. So if you could um, come up to the mic, I'm going to call your name and um, <coughs> succinctly uh, state your comments for the record. And again, please speak into the microphone. Speak slowly as uh, we have the court report here. So Dana Penny is the first uh, one who signed up to speak. Thank you. I, you already read my questions, and uh, I do have a comment. I'm in favor of solar. I have solar in my house, and it works. I also live near the substation and know what can happen, what can go wrong when a large company comes in with good intentions and their project doesn't work to their expectations. And I would hope that the people around this project, which if done right, I feel is a good thing, are happy. Thank you, Mr. Penny. 
Suzanne Fournier is our next uh, commenter. Good evening, Suzanne Fournier from Milford, New Hampshire, and I'm Woodwood Drive. Um, so, I'm also um, the coordinator for a local grassroots environmental group. It's called Bronx Environmental Citizens. So I oppose the location of Chinook Solar because the impacts to the environment are too great. Um, so in order for New Hampshire to reap the most benefits from solar, it needs, the solar needs to be in the right places. This place is a bad site for the following reasons, I think. Number one, we will lose forests. Now I understand it had been lost. Forest is still there. Um, so lots of forest. And the forest gives many benefits. They provide many, many benefits. Uh, number two, there will be impacts on the wildlife functions of the special wetlands known as vernal pools. They're scattered throughout <coughs> the site. And if they're turned into islands, um, you know, unreachable islands, or inhospitable islands, uh, that's a problem. Number three, effect on the already impelled landings turtle and the wood turtle. Without studying them at this site, how can anyone, meaning the applicant, how can anyone know what the effects of the project would be? There's a recent New Hampshire Supreme Court decision on this issue that I'll discuss uh, later in my comments. Number four, I also oppose this project because it is sprawling into green space. This is known as energy sprawl. I picked up that term when I was doing my research around New England and New Jersey. Uh, New Hampshire has hardly begun to put solar on existing structures and developed and degraded lands. It's not well thought out to be rolling out solar into current use conservation land in other green spaces. In fact, New Hampshire's 10-year energy plan that the governor puts out has sounded the alarm that if we try to meet our renewable energy goals by ground-mounted solar and wind, the repercussions for land use would be staggering. Number five, I've done research recently and wrote a white paper that I'm providing as part of these comments. In it, you'll see that Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Jersey are ahead of us, us people in New Hampshire, in that they've already learned that by sprawl and the loss of farmland and forest in other green spaces exchanged for solar, they are now steering developers to brownfields and other degraded and already developed space places and structures. And they're using incentives and disincentives to steer in the right direction. So in the white paper, I briefly mentioned that there's a project in Hopkinton and Webster on the town lines there, that was going to be 17 megawatts on the Orlando. Sounded great. But now the project has increased to 35 megawatts and will be almost entirely moved onto private land that it appears to have much forested green space. Um, so this is the kind of sprawl that is occurring right now in New Hampshire. I expect you'll be seeing that 35 megawatt uh, paperwork soon. So sprawl, and I'm going to call this sprawl here in Fitzwilliam, sprawling into current use green space could defeat the goals of the current use program that is to encourage the preservation of undeveloped farm and forest land. So if I have a couple more minutes, I'd like to continue um, by circling back just to two of the points I mentioned at the beginning in opposition. That's okay. Number one, forests provide much more than carbon sequestration, you know, carbon CO2. They provide cooling, climate resilience, clean water, 
in habitat for real turtles, like the blankings and wood turtles that affect this site. They've been noted for this project. So the question I have, should we be trading, it's rhetorical, should we be trading these environmental benefits of forests for the benefits of solar? I say we don't have to. What we have to do is look somewhere else to put the solar. So, number two, this site has many growing pools, and I think I remember the number being 45. You know, and the applicant divided the work between natural and man-made, perhaps, um, to wildlife. They don't know the difference, they just go to them. So, the vertical pools are so special. Why are they so special? They're so special because they are necessary for wildlife species that live in the forest that the project would cut down. They don't stay in the pools. The forest and the vernal pools go together, call the wetland complex. They go together for the survival of species like the Blanding's turtle and the amphibians that they eat. Those amphibians live in the forest as do the Blanding's turtle, but they also use the vernal pools. The applicant has stated in the paperwork that the known information about the Blanding's turtles and the wood turtle are that they live off-site. Fact is that without a survey on this site, their actual presence on site is just not known. That's information that is lacking. The applicant relied on the Natural Heritage Bureau report, which has a huge disclaimer that says, most of the nature's lands have not been surveyed, and I saw no information about Fish and Game Department saying that there had been any sort of survey of this land. Other than the bats, the bat survey has been done. So I want to tell you also that the New Hampshire Supreme Court recently decided a case, it was November of 2019, it involved New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, uh, its alteration of terrain program, and endangered wildlife. And I provided a copy of that decision for It's also available to anybody online at the Supreme Court's um, decision page. The court said that prior studies need to be done in order to know how to design properly the project so that the correct standard of protection of endangered wildlife is utilized. It's going back. They want you to use the correct standard. The regulation, <coughs> the regulation at issue is the ESS. It's ENV-WQ-1503.19H. The related, or it's kind of parallel, what the Site Evaluation Committee has, um, who have Site 301.07C4, that requires, and I'll quote, assessment of potential impacts of construction and operation of the proposed facility on significant wildlife species. So the Blanding's turtle and the Cuban turtle, and any other ones that might be found if a survey were correctly done. Um, so, again, the thought So how does the applicant provide an assessment without first surveying for endangered wildlife? And then second, without a long-term study of how the endangered animals are actually using the site prior to designing the project. And I'll note that when the applicant told us tonight when they discovered there were wetlands that showed up because of the climate, they saw the wetlands, they made adjustments. So similarly, with the study of endangered wildlife, how they're using the property, would be very important to make adjustments to a design. So I say, without such information or a survey or study of significant, you know, year or two study, you end up with what the applicant says they will do, and that is surround the entire construction area with silt fence. Now maybe they'll do that in sections, and they'll be broken up. It was mentioned that it would be some 100 feet, maybe 500 feet between sections. But nevertheless, I think it would add up to miles of silt fence that would be put up. Um, and silt fence blocks everybody. So this is what the applicant said. They, um, they would put up the silt fence around the entire construction area, and they said maybe in sections at a time, but there still would be miles of land
in the surface that would prevent land based turtles from getting to their burrowing pools to feed and the rest and other activities they do in the pools. They find the mates, um, and that would be in the spring and summer. So I unfortunately have the unpleasant experience saving turtles, um, lambs, and others. Turtles following a silt fence that has blocked their access to road pools in, in the town of Millbrook. So I hope you will review the Supreme Court's decision and decide to require a, a study, a survey, and long-term study. In closing, I want to stress that the environmental impacts on the endangered and rare wildlife are unknown in this study, but expected, at least by me, to be severe for the loss of the forest that would be cut down, um, you know, and the feral pools would be impacted because the forest is gone and that's part of the wildland complex. So the last point is that New Hampshire needs to wake up and stop energy sprawl as the other states are working to do before we lose hundreds and the thousands of acres that have been wisely saved in current use. So I thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moyer. Uh, Patricia Martin is the next speaker. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, I live in the next town over in Ringe, and I, first I want to express my gratitude to the people of Fitzwilliam for entertaining this project. Um, as we know, every energy project has a price, is a cost associated no matter what you do. Um, my understanding is that the land that this project is going on has been previously logged. And I wanted to give people a little perspective that the um, Burgess Biomass Plant um, up in Berlin, it um, burns through one acre of woodland per hour when it's operating to generate 75 megawatts of electricity. And so it would burn through an area of the proposed solar project in six days. Um, you know, every, as I said, every project has its cost. Um, the use of fossil fuels, uh, Professor Webler, Dr. Webler at Keene State College did an analysis and it turns out that um, fossil fuel projects, because we don't see all of it, actually requires about three times the amount of land. You know, it may be in Pennsylvania, it may not be in your backyard, but it requires three times as much land as um, a solar project. So I really encourage uh, Nexter to be very good to <coughs> the people of Fitzwilliam to um, be very careful about their um, wildlife and their species and to reward them well for hosting this project and that the project overall will be very successful so that it can be a model for um, making these projects um, available to be cited in other areas of New Hampshire. We have a lot of land um, and we don't have a lot of people. And so the land can be a resource for us. It can help with carbon sequestration. And having solar does not diminish the ability to do plantings underneath the solar panels that will help sequester carbon. It's a um, total solution and we have to be realistic about if not fossil fuels, then what is it that we want? So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Martin. And the uh, last speaker, unless uh, somebody else wants to fill one out, is uh, Stephanie Scher. Yes, Stephanie Scher, I believe it's William. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just thank all the Fitzwilliam residents who came out tonight. Um, it is a weeknight, sometimes we're tired and we put these things aside, but it's important to our town. Um, 
In 2014, Kinder Morgan tried to put the Northeast Energy Direct directly through this town. And I won't seem to forget that, and I won't let you forget it either. Uh, they wanted to take out some of the houses of our residents, and they wanted to put it through our wetlands and through a pristine aquifer. They wanted to put it through our neighbors' towns and through a lot of southern New Hampshire. We were angry, upset, hurt, frightened, stressed out, worried about what was going to happen to our town. And at that time, we would have been super thankful for this project. And that doesn't mean this project is perfect. It means that we need to be just as cautious and thoughtful in the things that we ask about this and hope that it is well cited. And I think that some excellent questions have been brought up tonight. Those of you that have questions when you go home or you learn something else, please ask for resources on how you can still send those questions in because those questions are really important and they'll be documented. Um, after that Ned Pipeline was withdrawn, and that was Kinder Morgan along with Liberty Utilities, this town learned a great deal about what was going on around it, and we put money into surveying our wetlands, and we designated prime wetlands, and we have a list of more wetlands that we can potentially designate prime because we have the entire town surveyed and found out what an amazing resource we have. So that's something that next era should know that you care about and you want to preserve. And so we are going to be watching carefully and want you to be very protective of that. We care about those things. Um, the Granite Bridge Pipeline is now being pushed by Liberty Utilities, who learned a lot from Kinder Morgan, and so the pipeline threat is not gone. And in this project coming to Fitzwilliam, it, it's helpful to us and we need to be supportive of solar projects and other renewable energy projects because of the fact that that pipeline threat is still very real. It's not in our town today, but it could be tomorrow. And we have senators, state senators from both parties who are in full support of fossil fuel expansion in our state. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but now you know. And I would suggest that you talk to them about your support for renewable energy projects such as this. Uh, I get a lot of questions about this project, even when I don't know the answer, I try to find them. But the most frequent question that I personally receive is, hey, you know, I'll support it, but is the energy for our town? Because if it's not for our town, I'm not interested. But it's for all of us. It goes into the grid, and therefore we all share it. So even if it doesn't seem like it's just for Fitzwilliam, it is for Fitzwilliam because that's where our energy comes from. It goes into shared resources. Um, so yes, we do benefit from that. Um, in terms of our neighbor from Milford, I'd just like to address a few things. I grew up in New Jersey and my biggest concern was that we were losing farmland and still are at an alarming rate and it's from development. And so in New Jersey, absolutely, rooftop solar should be pushed as quickly as possible, not for the loss of green space that's still happening at an alarming rate. But that's a problem here in New Hampshire as well. When I moved here in 1993, there was a lot less development than there is now. And when you live here, you don't see that happening because it happens in a little time. And I can tell you that it has changed a great deal. So yes, when we have those surfaces, when we have parking lots or malls, we should be thinking about, hey, is the parking lot porous? And can we cover that parking lot and those buildings with solar panels? And it should absolutely be our first preference. However, we do need to make room for it as quickly as possible. We need to make sure that we're getting on this because the climate emergency is real, it's here, we all know that it's happening. Deny or not, it's in our face. It's on TV, it's in videos, it's real, there's no denying it. And New Hampshire is facing some extreme consequences already. We have wildlife that are in detrimental situations. We're losing our moose, whales, cod, shrimp. Those are our livelihoods in many ways, not just things that we eat and hunt, but they're things that bring tourists to our city, to our town, to our homes. This is important to us, and the only way to protect that is to think about our future right now, every day, it's an emergency. Um, I also just want to say, um, I ask that our Conservation Commission please consider um, doing what you can to find out about any impact to wetland services, because Scott Brook is a really important resource for us. And lastly, just to say that if you didn't know it already, that Fitzwilliam is one of the towns, and so is Ridge, 
that participated in Solarize in the Madnock this past summer. There was a great deal of interest in residential solar. And so people are interested, they're engaged, they're learning more. It's something we need to embrace, but I thank you for your support. I do support this project, but as I said, I also want to make sure that it's well cited. Um, and I ask you to continue asking questions and to attend these things and speak with your neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Is there anybody else who would uh, like to make a public comment? Hearing none, I guess we will uh, adjourn the hearing. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and we look forward to seeing you on February 20th at 6 p.m. Thank you.